Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Oh, people are still coming in. Maybe I should take a moment. Yeah. So welcome to the third of the end-to-end -end exchange sessions and the final session here in the big hall. Uh, and it's called Next to Devastation. I'm only going to briefly introduce our moderator and host, Ryan Bishop, who will introduce the session and the speakers more in full. Ryan, you provided us with a very brief bio this year. Um, if I read it, it's quick. Ryan Bishop is a professor of global art and politics at the Winchester School of Art, University of <coughs> Southampton. And together with Jussi Paika, he co-directs the Archaeologies of Media and Technology Research Group at the Winchester School of Art. But Ryan, you're also, of course, a long-time collaborator of the Transmediale, and I had the pleasure to work with you many times over my years at artistic director, and you're an avid supporter and contributor to the festival, and I'm extremely happy that you are chairing this session and that you helped facilitate to get Bernhard Stiegler uh, as a guest here tonight. Um, so I'd like to welcome you, Ryan, and the speakers, please. Thank you, Christopher, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, before we start, I did want to take just a quick minute to say uh, thank you to uh, the team at uh, Transmediali who have been running off their feet, and I would like us to uh, acknowledge them in the traditional manner. And as Christopher said, uh, we've been uh, collaborating on Transmediali for a number of years, and even though he's handing off the festival to very, very capable and innovative hands with Nora, I think we also should give uh, acknowledgement to Christopher for all he's done over the years. It's been a real pleasure and a real joy. Okay, um, and speaking of real joys and bleak joys, uh, we are going to be, uh, the, the title for the panel is Next to Devastation. And I'm going to just say a very brief uh, opening comment and then introduce our first speaker, Bernard Stiegler. Uh, the phrase next to in English is spatial, sequential, and comparative. Spatial in terms of relation of objects, thoughts or processes, sequential in terms of steps in a process, as in next to devastation, or in the title of the festival, end to end, and comparative in terms of meaning instead of, or almost but not quite. Thus, next to devastation equates with the closest comparable event. In other words, next to devastation is our current existential condition, the imperative of the present. And thus, next to devastation that is spatially and temporally alongside devastation, in parallel to it and as an alternative to it, we might think of the networks that have been destroyed or ended by current conditions that could be revisited, appropriated, resuscitated, to slow or alter the devastation apparently unfolding around us and enveloping us. In terms of the sequential meaning of next to, it is useful to avoid casting sequences as necessarily teleological because it is a too easy slide into eschatology. The spatial next to, the para possibilities, offer us glimmers of agency if not necessarily a quantum measure of hope. To think through what might reside alongside devastation, physically, conceptually, politically, and socially. We have assembled a wonderful panel of friends of the festival 
whose work many of you know and have thus congregated to hear and engaged in conversation tonight. The first speaker will be Bernard Stiegler, whose pivotal work on techniques and time finds echoes in the opening exchange this morning. Bernard is a leading figure in contemporary thought on techniques, media, and social justice. His provocative new collective project, The Internation, takes its prompt from the centenary of the League of Nations, delving into its myriad visions, failed potentialities, and future promise in the United Nations, with which the project is in dialogue, to craft theoretical and practical projects between collaborative localities. The goal is to, gee, to achieve a different kind of microeconomic model than currently exists within the constitution of the globe as entirely and fully and desirably calculable. The import of place and locality proves paramount in, the, in this set of concerns, and what a wonderful venue we are in tonight to, to ponder and engage such concerns as place and loca locality. So I welcome to the stage my friend uh, Bernard Stigler. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Christopher, for your invitation. It's a very good occasion for meeting some very good friends like Matthew Fuller and Olga and many other people here in the, in the room. Um, I will show you some images. So I must open my computer if I can have. Uh, yes, here and this. Uh, page that is a website, the name of the website is internation.world. You will find, you will soon find the electronic version of a book entitled Elements of a, Rip, a Response to Antonio Guterres, who is a Secretary General of the United Nations, and Greta Thunberg. Here is Antonio Guterres, maybe you, show, you saw that one year ago in Davos, not last uh, week, but uh, the year before. And uh, of course, you know probably uh, Greta Thunberg. And um, we address this book to them, not only to them, but firstly to them, also to the, what we call the Thunberg generation. And the core of the book, the core of the argument of this book is that decarbonization is possible only under the condition of a deproletarianization of work. You know that the COP25 held in Madrid showed to what degree neither the IPCC nor Greta Thunberg and Antonio Guterres nor the movements that she has sparked, uh, Greta Thunberg, in use, are being heard by the political and economic powers. The view of the international collective is that, in addition to, what, to all the particular conflicts of interest, with the general interests that clearly exist on the side of both governments and corporations, thanks to which they fail to live up to their responsibilities. This state of affairs is due primarily to the fact that implementation of truly decisive and effective measures to combat climate change, and more generally, disorders tied to the excesses of the Anthropocene era, depends upon profoundly changing the scientific models that have dominated the industrial economy since the late 18th century, since David Hume and uh, Isaac Newton. These models all have a fundamentally Newtonian construction, inasmuch as they ignore the question of entropy. Integrating these issues raised 
by this question are the toxic aspects of development are all expressions of these issues, presupposes modifying the microeconomic and macroeconomic axioms, theorems, methods, instruments and organizations of the global industrial economy. An industrial economy characterized by the fact that, like technology, it integrates scientific formalisms with knowledge and with technical production methods. Humanity as a whole has a challenge of formalizing and bringing into play at the level of the planetary economy new theoretical models equal to the real situation. It is possible for such a discourse to be listened to any more than have the warnings that have constantly been issued since 1970, excuse me, 1992, which, despite the countless catastrophes that have now unfolded in the biosphere, of which the 2019 fires provide the most dreadful images, have remained without effect. Such a discourse can become audible, and in the short term, to the extent that it turns the challenge into an opportunity to create new forms of economic activity, industrial as well as artisanal, agricultural, and in terms of services based on the struggle against entropy, more solvent forms that, with a traditional and in-depth approach, progressively redefine first investment and work, and second employment, by taking advantage of the automation currently underway, not so that technology will become capable of resolving all, pro all problems, but so that technology will be able to stre strengthen the capabilities of individuals and groups in the struggle against entropy, and in so doing, and in a strict sense, to enable them to earn their living, in French we say, gagner leur vie, to regain their life, both individually and collectively. From nine different angles, corresponding to nine chapters, this work proposes in the, the book we will publish next week on the website, a diagnosis of the present situation first, and then a theoretical formalization of its causes, consequences, and possible transformations. Third, a method of large-scale social experimentation based on the rapid transfer of the results of contributory research. Fundamental research, applied research, and action research in the form of contributory economic models. And fourth, the sharing of results and experiments by consolidating them on a global scale through a specific organization inspired by the concept of internation outlined by Marcel Mauss in 19. 20. No, it's not this one, sorry. The nine angles are first epistemology, second territorial dynamics, third contributory economy, fourth contributory research, fifth internation, sixth contributory design, and Hert Loving here present contributed to this chapter, seventh ethics, eighth addiction and dopaminergic system, and ninth, global political economy of carbon, that is of fire, that produces entropy, and silicon, that is of information, that can produce entropy or negentropy. The international collective that is constituted by those people, some of other people are entering now. Achille Membe was at the beginning, but we have no news from him now. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, the International Collective was formed in order to confront these questions of axioms, theorems, methods, instruments, and organizations of the global industry economy in the context of automation through a progressive transformation of macroeconomic norms, starting from the, an experimentally driven process of transition aimed at setting up an alternative industrial macroeconomy through which all aspects related to the Anthropocene's encounter with its own limits would be addressed in a functional and systemic way. I say systemic in the sense of the general theory of systems. 
The name International Collective was adopted in November 2019. And uh, it was inspired, the word intervention, by Marcel Mauss in this text uh, that he wrote uh, during uh, the creation of the League of Nations. And he said, don't forget that uh, the international is based on nations, and nations are localities. We say ourselves that localities are the condition of Negantropy. This is what is demonstrated by Irving Schrödinger in 1944 in this famous book that you know, probably the title being What is Life? On 10th of January this, this year, the work which will be published now and uh, in two months in books in English and in French we met uh, the 10th of January, uh, Youth for Climate and Extinction Rebellion. And we decided to work uh, with them and to carry it out within the framework of the Association of Friends of the Turnberg Generation. This is the foundation of this uh, association, a project that was um, presented first at the Pompidou Center the 17th December of last year, created from a proposal to transform the Ars Industrialist Association. This proposal came from uh, Jean-Marie Le Clésio, the Nobel Prize of Literature, but also Richard Sennett and some friends of mine. The vocation of the Association of the Friends of Thunberg Generation, you can find here on the website Mediapart, it's a very famous website in, in France, the blog of this association now, it, is, it was created two weeks ago, is to, the, the vocation is to open up an ongoing dialogue with the youth movements struggling to cope with the climate emergency, starting from Greta Thunberg's demand to listen to the scientists, as she says, in order to formulate well-considered proposals from various standpoints with notable generation, de, generational differences, this being a source of enrichment, of course. The International Collective met for the first time on the 22nd September 2018 at the Serpentine Galleries in London after its director, Hans Ulrich Obris, suggested that we organize a debate on the question of work in the 21st century and that we do so in reference to a program of social experimentation and contributory research that you can find described here in French and in English, launched in Saint-Saint-Denis, that is a, a district in the north of Paris, in 2016 under the name of Territoire Apprenant Contributive, that is in English, Contributory Learning Territory. The collective has set itself the task of submitting proposals to the United Nations in order to rethink work in the 21st century on new theoretical and practical basis. In the, in the context of an essential transformation of the industrial economy, which at the end of the Anthropocene era is confronted with its own toxic effects, self-destructive. In other words, it is a question of facing up to the injunctions regularly formulated by the scientific world with regard to the immediate future of humanity and life on Earth. The scientific work analyzing the threats to the biosphere posed by the industrial development of human societies emerged within the United Nations context in 1972 in Stockholm with the first Earth Summit held that year then in Stockholm. In the same year at, that the Stockholm Summit was held, the famous Meadows Report, a commission given to MIT by the Club of Rome, was published as, under the title, The Limits of Growth. A year earlier, Nicolas georgescu Ragans the Anthropolo and the Economic Process was published by Harvard University Press. In 1976, Arnold Toynbee's Mankind and Mother Earth appeared, followed in 1979 by René Passé's L'Economique et le Vivant in French. 
long before all these works. An article by Alfred Lotka, this one, was printed in a 1945 issue of the journal Human Biology under the title The Law of Evolution as a Maximal Principle. This article and Lotka's earlier work, in a way synthesized in the 19. 45 article, received broad discussion in our work. Lotka was a mathematician and a biologist who studied entropy in the field of life as early as the 1920s, and it is notable that his reflections came to the attention of Vladimir Vernatsky, who referred to them together with those of Alfred Whitehead in the final chapter of the Biosphere in 1926. Those texts, those statements, those research, those scientific theories were completely ignored by economics. As has already been mentioned, the proposals of the international, Internation Collective are inspired by the ongoing experimental contributory learning territory in the suburbs of Paris devoted to the invention of work in the context of a contributory economy. The future, of, the future of work, which is more or less the heart of all these analyses, is fundamentally and functionally linked to climate and envir environmental issues. In the book Le Travail au XXIe siècle, Alain Supio, I participated myself to this book, Alain Supio, who is a very, very famous lawyer and jurist in, in France and in the world, writes that, I quote him, through its work, Homo Faber aims in principle to adapt its vital milieu to its needs, or in other words, to create a cosmos from out of chaos, a humanly livable world from out the worldness. The world less, excuse me, the world less. But conversely, its work can, whether voluntary or not, also destroy or devastate, this is devastation, its vital milieu and make it humanly unlivable. This question of work and the ecological question are thus inextricably linked, unquote. Unlike employment, from which it is therefore strictly distinguished, just as it is distinguished from labor or toil, that is said in ancient Greek, ponos, work, that is said in ancient Greek, ergon, particularly in Aristotle philosophy, is here conceived above all as a production of knowledge, not only academic knowledge, all forms of knowledge. In 1945, however, Lotka showed that the production of knowledge is the condition of the struggle against entropy for this technical form of life that is human life. If the organogenesis in which the evolution of life is in general consists produces endosomatic organs, like this bean, for example, spontaneously ordered by biological constraints, then, in the specifically human form of life, organogenesis is also exosomatic. It is exosomatization. In what Alfred Lotka calls exosomatic evolution, artificial organs are produced by the cooperation of human groups and this always involves knowledge that intensifies their negantropic capability that, rather than the, their entropic tendencies. With respect to cooperation and with respect to the development of the division of work as the acquisition of constantly renewed knowledge, recent paleoanthropology in North America and Australia has shown that it was the condition of survival of Homo sapiens, and before that was the condition of hominization itself. In his recent work, Richard Sennett has brought this question into the context of the contemporary world. Exosomatic organs are bivalent. They amount to what Socrates called pharmaca, that is both 
poisons and remedies. And this is why, by its work, Homo Faber can as easily produce a cosmos as devastate its milieu. The practice of exosomatic organs must therefore be prescribed by theories and practices as well as by the empirical knowledge supplied by experience and transmitted by education. Georgescu Regan takes up Lotka's perspective, arguing that it is the economy that has a function of limiting entropy and increasing neg entropy. For Georgescu Regan, this means that the economy must no longer be based exclusively on Newtonian physics, but must integrate both thermodynamics as a question of entropy and biology as a question of neg entropy. Here, however, we must reiterate that in Lotka's view and beyond uh, a strictly biological question, it is possible for the economy to limit the entropy of exosomatic organs and increase their neg entropy only if it valorizes knowledge. Hence, it is in order to avoid being trapped in a biological model whose inadequacy was described by Lotka that we refer to what I call entropy with ANH, but also neg entropy and neg anthropology, positing that what produces neg entropy is knowledge in all its forms. Once the vital value of knowledge has been recognized, as it is also said here, for example, by Alfred Whitehead, but also here by George Canguilhem, who was a, was a philosopher, but also a doctor. It becomes necessary to analyze the consequences of the fact that from the beginning of the Anthropocene era, assuming that this can be dated from the Industrial Revolution, work has been transformed into employment. And the knowledge that was implemented by work has been progressively transformed into machinic formalisms. This has resulted in a structural impoverishment of employment, ever more clearly proletarianized, something that already worried Adam Smith and which will be at the center of Marxist theory. Today we know that above all, this impoverishment consists in an entropic development of employment with as we know, disastrous consequences for the environment. Second, a loss of meaning, which lies at the origin of what is now called suffering at work, but it is also the origin marginally of demotivation and the crisis of human resources. And third, the replacement of proletarianized employees by robots on automata, whether robotic or algorithmic. And as was uh, highlighted by an MIT report taken up by Oxford, proletarianized jobs tending to disappear and the activity of pure labor, panos in Greek, without work, ergon in Greek, being transferred to automated, automated machines. The employment variable, however, which is crucial to the development model called the perpetual growth economy, is for this reason systematically oriented to fall, with the result that the overall solvency of the model is necessarily and irreversibly compromised. Irrevers irreversibly, unless there is a change of macroeconomic model and of its functions and variables. It is to propose achievable and experimental pathways to such a change which must occur as a matter of urgency that the international collective is advocating a specific experimental approach called contributory research. And this is the reason for which we, we wrote a letter to Antonio Guterres and Richard Sennett gave this letter to him in December. And this is also the reason for which we met the United Nations in Geneva at the beginning of January and we are now discussing with these United Nations. It is on the basis of this observation of a systematically downward tendency of proletarianized employment and the subsequent need for the productivity gains obtained by automation to be re redistributed via work performed and remunerated outside 
employment. That the program of the contributory learning territory has been developed in the Seine-Saint-Denis, in the suburbs of Paris, which thus conducts experiments in the development of a contributory economy. Work outside employment means a knowledge activity that is not yet economically and socially valued. In the context of the Anthropocene era, we must invest in the development of this kind of work in order to foster the emergence of new knowledge of how to live, how to make, how to conceive differently, capable of disintoxicating the industrial economy. The goal of the contributory economy as a macroeconomic model based on microeconomic and mesoeconomic territorial activities, that is local in the sense of Erwin Schrödinger, is thus to revalorize knowledge of all kinds, from that of the mother who raises her child in the epoch of touch screens, an issue being worked on by the contributory clinic of the Plain Commune Contributory Learning Territory, to the most formalized and mathematized forms of knowledge which are disrupted by black boxes and passing through the work knowledge of the manual and intellectual workers or in the epoch of automation. In this conception of contributory economy, which remunerates work through a contributory income inspired by the French model of intermittent entertainment workers, employment, which becomes intermittent, is functionally deproletarianized. This also means that new ways of organizing work inspired by First, by free software organization, and Matthew Fuller is, of course, a thinker of that, also Gert Levink, but also by action research methods practiced by institutional psychiatry and those studied by Gregory Bateson through the Alcoholic Anonymous Association, for example, as the famous cyber cybernetic of the self, are implemented through sis specific systems and institutions. Starting from the case of Saint-Saint-Denis, management institutes of the contributory economy have been conceived and designed in a uh, description of which will be found uh, uh, in the website, on the website. Here, the decarbonization of economy, therefore, implies a deproletarianization of industry. Of course, this evolution does not concern all jobs, but it centrally concerns all those that tend to decrease the entropic human footprint, the human form of entropy production also being called anthropogenic forcings in the 2014 IPCC report and refer to more generally, for example, in geography as anthropization. This is why we, we, we use the term entropy, but also negentropy and anti-entropy in the sense of Giuseppe Longo in order to qualify the specifically human form of entropy with an E and no H. The increase of entropy in thermodynamic biological and informational forms is a specific feature of the Anthropocene era. The issue at stake with entropy is to reconstitute negentropic potentials. What defines knowledge as knowledge, moreover, is precisely its negentropic character, negentropic with A and H. Decarbon decarbonization, like deproletarianization, does not just concern work and employment activity in production of, or services. This is also the detoxification of consumers, that is, the deproletarianization of ways of life. Here, an immense educational project opens up, whose terms and stakes are profoundly new and which cannot wait for the reforms of educational institutions, which are increasingly disastrous, but must, on the contrary, lead to social dynamics of civil society that nourish and transform educational edu uh, institutions. All knowledge of whatever kind, empirical, parental, artistic, sporting, scientific, academic, or social, in all the senses that we can give to this last adjective, knows, social, knows something of the world in that it adds 
something to this world. It knows that this world is unfinished, and this was explained very clearly by Whitehead and then by Erwin Hubble. It is unfinished because it is a process, it's not being, and that we must continue to make it unfold towards a future against devastation, to make it happen. This adding something through which the world happens through knowledge is a negantropic contribution to human worlds. Deprived of such knowledge, employment can become toxic and devastate its milieu, as Alain Supio points out. It is precisely in such deprivation, however, that proletarianization consists and here lies the deepest origin of the Anthropocene era that is now reaching its limits. The IPCC reports precisely describe such limits from the climatological perspective. At the origin of thermodynamic anthropization lies the toxic anthropization of human life, itself produced by the anthropization of knowledge. By defining knowledge above all as negantropic potential in the wake of Alfred Whitehead and George Canguilhem, the elements of a response to Antonio Guterres and Greta Thunberg presented here consist above all in reconsidering the very purpose of the economy in general, in particular when the latter, having become industrial, functionally and systematically mobilizes scientific knowledge. We believe that territorial scientific economic legal, legal, political and technological cooperation through territories in transition networks in all areas of production, including agriculture, industry and services, would contribute to changing the state of affairs through territorial laboratories engaged in the experimental approaches that are simultaneously scientific, entrepreneurial, social, technological, cultural, and artistic. This is what we propose to uh, Antonio Guterres. The scientific investigation of these problems and the, invent and the invention of consensual solutions require the, the implementation of new research methods capable of tightly linking populations, economic actors, politicians, institutions, foundations, and international research organization, organizations, in, engage in the transdisciplinary approach leading local societies through rapid transfer processes and networks of experimentation to develop reproducible recommendations. Now for that we need a new type of platforms. We call that territorial platforms. Of course those territorial platforms at the micro level of the territory must uh, consolidate their data at the mesoeconomic and at the meso level and macro level of the biosphere itself. But for that, we have to redefine what uh, I call the structure of data. Today, the data on the platforms are only calculable. You have the possibility to put a data only if there is an algorithm capable to calculate it. Now, something that is completely calculable is entropic. This was very well showed by a scientist, a mathematician in America, the name is Pulse, John Pulse, in Virginia uh, University. Today, the so-called social networks are entropic. They are destroying society. The reason for which I show you this, it is because this is a platform I use myself, I used in when I was teaching, because now I'm retired in the University of Compiègne, as a platform for capturing the, the negantropic possibilities of my students. That is the differences that are not calculable, the incomparable statements of my students that were uh, nourishing my own work. You know. Today we try to develop that on, at this, on this territory in the suburbs of Paris. It's for uh, 100,000 people uh, to create a new kind of local democracy using algorithms, but not for short-circuiting the decision, for sustaining a decision that is incalculable. And this is this incalculability that is producing negantropy. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Bernard. The second talk this evening comes jointly from Olga Garanova and Matt Fuller. Olga is at Royal Holloway in London, and Matt is at Goldsmiths. And the talk will draw from their beautifully and harrowingly evocative work entitled Bleak Joys, recently published by University of Minnesota Press. Ranging, across wide, ranging widely across material, affective, incommensurabilities, such as devastation, anguish, luck, and home, they use as one of many props for their multi-scaled reflections and inquiries into an ethical, aesthetic formulation, uh, a particular prompt that I've really latched onto from Mikhail Bakhtin that says, you can't live by the completeness of yourself and the events. You cannot act. In order to live, you need to be incomplete, open for yourself. You need to be for yourself as yet to become, should not coincide with that you presently are. So I welcome to the stage Olga and Matt. Okay, thank you. Um, we're coming from a strange place in that about two hours time from now, the UK leaves, um, leaves the EU. And uh, so we're very glad to be in Berlin amongst friends. And if anyone can give us political asylum, please. Yeah, as, as Ryan said, um, we're gonna talk a little about some of the, some of the ideas that are in uh, Bleak Joys. And we're also kind of very intrigued by some of the, the amazing kind of resonances with uh, some of the, the ideas that Bernard has just uh, discussed. So some of the kind of same genealogy of ideas uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking about from slightly different, a different set of tangents. Okay. So the image uh, that we're going to show now is from a film um, by Kira Muratova, uh, Three Stories from 97. And it's the kind of, it's an example of the kind of thing we're presenting uh, in Bleak Joys. So I just want you to watch. So this is seen uh, from three stories by Muratova. It's an example of the kind of thing we're presenting uh, in Bleak Joys. On the one level, it plays out a combination of the cute and the disgusting, but it also diagrams the problem of eating a chicken that is larger than you whilst moving along a fence. <laughs> Something I guess a few of you recognize. And the problem of being a chicken, a species marked for slaughter. But both animals are framed within human industrial production of the cute and invested in and of the grotesque and digested. The scene from the film provides a diagram of many interacting forces, the art of balance in a situation that is unstable but perpetuated, the game of chicken. And we're interested in the wider question of how interacting forces are constituted and diagrammed one of these, indeed, might well be entropy, as Bernard discusses. These are elaborated on the economic level, that of technology, and the subjectival level. And all of these are aesthetic in different ways, in that they constitute modes of knowing, seeing, and doing. So Bleak Joys uh, is a book about ecological aesthetics, and an attempt to develop an understanding of complex entities and processes from plant roots to forests to ecological damage as dynamic processes of composition, even though they're destructive in some, in some cases. We aim to sketch a mutual interaction of beings, natural processes, unnatural processes, extraction and abstraction that produces a polyphonic dance of sensing, understanding, 
reworking and of an expression. The model of ethico aesthetics, as Ryan mentioned, is the one we draw from Mikhail Bakhtin and widen it to an understanding of the ecological. Such a polyphony, the emergence of a composition through multiple forces, has political implications. It is differential and asymmetric. A part of this is diagrammed in the idea of what we're calling ontological load. We can explain this term by the notion of chance. Chance and its elaborations, such as risk, fate, and luck, is a key figure in, in this work. Uh, what are the odds on life? Who and what will have to perish in contemporary society's ecological gambles, structured through innumerable decisions, calculations, assessments, neglect, fear, and delirium? What in turn are the ways in which such structurations enter into and prefigure chance? These are descriptions of causality and the active diagramming of chance, which acts as a variant form of constraint, competition, and impossibility. Chance, in the forms of luck, fate, and risk, are forms of hypotheses. But they're also a means of directing, explaining, and experiencing the different ontological loads, by which we mean the variable exposures and ability to act upon a distribution of chance that cultures, ecologies, and moments undergo. These ontological loads are expressed by a hyperdimensional range of variables, but particularly expressed by those such as race, class, gender, species. It's a task of ethico aesthetics to sense and to change these. An important motive uh, of this work is um, an argument against <clears throat> the idea of the end. There are proliferating discourses about climate change and, as an apocalypse, tuned into a certain hunger for finality in the West. And, you know, I'm Russian, believe me, we love the apocalypse. There are multiple problems with this, uh, however. First, that the catastrophe already started 500 years ago with Columbus. And second, that the end is a luxury, as much as a cultural habit that allows for continuing political gambling on the basis of the limit that has yet uh, not been reached. The problem is not the end, but the devastating processes structured as irresolvable. So in this talk, we are, um, will present work from two chapters of the book, Devastation and Irresolvability, and then we'll come to conclusion. Devastation is a becoming that seizes, eliminates, or radically changes the conditions <clears throat> of other becomings. It goes against a certain sense in the discussions of extinction as the diminution of the, of the variety of species. This is important, but something more is occurring. In conditions of devastation, it is not only a set of things that become extinct, affecting the others in a cascading logical fashion, but is something more substantial, an existing multiplicity that fails to actualize, a certain potentiality that is wounded in a way that makes it implode, makes it actualize a devastating becoming. So devastations are not simply diminutions of things, but are a kind of becoming in which the virtual, the process of change, is altered, parched, or maybe enhanced in a menacing way. The active growth of devastation is not the individually unthinkable scope of death. So we can look at the example um, of Chernobyl, which uh, recently celebrated uh, its 30th anniversary, or is about to. Um, it's widely known that due to the lack of anthropogenic factors in the exclusion zone, there is now a thriving biodiversity there, and some rare animals are spotted. But although there are brown bears and lynxes caught on camera traps, some animals bear mutations, such as smaller brains, smaller antennae, smaller brood sizes, and shorter lifespans. At another scale, the biochemical effects of radiation interfere with the microbial and fungal activity and the ability to process biological decay. And this leads to the conservation of the dead. Thousands of trees are undecayed in the same spot where they died. So this is called rust forest, and you can really see um, 
the, the difference in, in the color of the forest. This interference with the dead is of a different quality to the afterlife. It is a certain arrest of death. There's another picture and you can also see uh, a line there really clearly. There's a lot of literature on vitalist affirmative idea of death. There's an idea of death as a deposit, death, death as a very heart of life, something that contemporary biology describe as, and um, uh, Bartholomew wrote about a uh, philosopher as the cellular suicide that plays an essential role in our body in the course of construction. So um, in a developing embryo, the death of certain cells um, will allow for the separation of bones. All this contributes to a certain idea of death as an origin of life, the death that cannot be repeated in life itself, and here is the theme of um, the death attraction and the death as an origin. But devastations take things out of cyclical or determined states into proliferating conditions of depletion. In the case of Chernobyl, with depletion of fungal and bacterial activity, the nutrients are not returned to soil. Such change delinks the source of life in non-life or other forms of life and alters the process of becoming. This is not simply a deferral of a usual process with trees stored for later decay, but a certain arrest of death in life that is itself a kind of growth. The trees standing there in their unrotted state and effectively becoming excellent kindling until a forest fire. Then smoke and ashes would spread the radioactive material far beyond the current exclusion zone, possibly. This would be a growth, an affirmative becoming for radiation as a kind of devastation. The proposition of devastation is not simply a description of an ecological chain of being, but it is about an introduction of a nullity in the virtual, which is about a reduction in the conditions of possibilities for the actual. We want to make an intervention in the vocabulary of affirmative philosophy, because beyond the recognition of the university of being, there needs to be vocabulary to describe proliferating expansive kinds of expansive kinds of growth that parch the virtual. Another significant fact about devastation is that their unfolding is frequently gamed, manipulated or gambled on for political advantage. Be perhaps because obliter total obliteration is unimaginable, unrepresentable, that which edges towards it is not yet it. Devastation becomes the negotiable continuum. What should be a convincing limit is seen as a foundation upon which what is imagined to be political and economic advantage can be made. Tap dancing on the rim of an abyss that cannot be seen looks so convincing if the dancers themselves cannot see the edge. A moral, if not conceptual or speculative limit, thus provides the grounds for speculation upon its transgression on the basis that gambles will be made on the idea that it cannot be transgressed. So discussion of devastation in the book starts an exploration into a wider modus operandi of power as a kind of external structuration as well as a form of subjectivation that we refer to as irresolvability. So yeah, we're going to move on to discussing uh, what we mean by resolvability. We wanted to take this text from uh, the Berlin writer Christa Wolff uh, to think about this. She writes, uh, what made Stone Age people or primitive farmers unhappy was different in kind from the misfortunes of modern men and women. There is no way they could have felt the terrible demands of conscience we feel when we see that we cannot avoid making a decision, but that none of our choices is the right one. Christopher, Christopher Wolfe was talking specifically about the, the structure of the Cold War uh, and the, the, particularly around the structure of the Cold War by game theory that we're going to talk about specifically and how this continues into the present. So irresolvability is the structural incapacity to sort out a problem. It's a means of establishing a general economy of deterrence, dysfunction, a generalized condition of sludginess, Irresolvability names the condition in which structuring and capacity of action of the Cold War becomes a part of the everyday infrastructure of feeling. 
Irresolvability occurs through the employment of technologies and ideas of technology integrated into economic and organizational forms and processes of subjectivation. The Cold War started in the obliterating heat of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Part of, part of what followed was the attempt to map and articulate the consequences of such a disaster, a condition of an irremovable possibility of indiscriminate annihilation, out of which there is no way and outside of which it is impossible to think. In this new global infrastructure of feeling, some of the same mathematicians that were involved in the Manhattan Project came to mark out and schematize this terrain in economic terms. One of the key fruits of this was John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern's theory of games and economic behavior. As well as providing a technical foundation for the economics of the present, that is the, the neoliberalism that Bernard talked about, the book also became a root source for game theory and the theory of deterrence in the Cold War. The book emphasizes strategic thinking as a basic principle of interaction between entities in the world, one based on asymmetric competition and collaboration with absolute conditions of winning and losing zero-sum games being highly emphasized, even if only as a fantasy that keeps the game in motion. A little later in the history of game theory, other formations such as the celebrated Nash Equilibrium also came into circulation as models of metastability in which no absolute victory need take place. This is being an example of Nash Equilibrium in the prisoner's dilemma. The worst case scenario is that one prisoner talks and the other does not. The talker walks, the other has a longer sentence. The optimal condition uh, is that both walk free if neither speak, neither grass each other up. More likely, it assumes that both snitch on each other and neither getting a long sentence, but neither getting free, a non-optimal form of balance. Aside from its strategic aspect, the aim is to also to describe economic activity. That is, under this rubric, all human choice. We argue that the notion of choice in neoliberal economic thought has a common technical genealogy with that of the Cold War. Under the presently dominant form of economics, a key state of things is the notion of choice. Choice becomes something determined solely by price and its various subcategories on the one hand, and by a technical formulation of deterrence on the other. That is that deterrence is integrated into the heart of the economic idea of choice. Our argument is that these are not distinct things. Choice translated into price and choice as deterrence converge. Some things are rendered not simply unchoosable, but irresolvable. Choice permits a grammar of prediction and preemption. It sets up the dance of brinksmanship by which states play with each other. But in this grammar, certain things are unsayable, rendered irresolvable. This is a psychic as well as societal condition. Irresolvability converges in your being. In a phrase resonant with the work of Bakhtin, Kathy Acker in Blood and Guts in High School says, politics don't disappear, but take place inside my body. Leek Joyce argues that politics is also an ecology taking place in and through the subject. Here, the strategic apparatus laid out by the architecture of choice weaves subjectivity, politics, and ecology together. At a micro scale, the architectures of choice automata are found in addiction forming and grammatization, to cite Bernard, in apps, games, and economies. What happens at the micro scale recurs at the macro scale. You must make a choice. None of the choices you can make is the right one. What Claude Shannon notes about von Neumann's theory of automata is its ability to make reliable machines out of unreliable components, carrying through indeed to the design of networks. This strategic diagram is not a complete system, but a multitude of many millions of formalisms, some that remain as ghosts. Each one is maintained by the bluff of statecraft, of subjectivity, of norm observance. Bluffing is regarded as a key skill in deterrence, something we see played out in the world every day. 
The interactions between millions of half-decayed formalisms and the bluffs that sustain them is the diagram of our societies. The critical recognition of irresolvability calls its bluff and allows us to begin moves beyond it. So in conclusion, <clears throat> we take for granted that we need to shift the economy, forms of energy, diet, forms of construction. We need to have different relations to materials and to consumption. But it seems there's also a choice to be made in how to do this. Some people propose something that we can call an aesthetics of austerity. In the movement of capitalism over time, there's a shift from an episteme within which the desire had to be combated in Christianity to one at which it has to be maximized and managed in the market economy, such as in the liberal economy. In many arguments for measures such as the Green New Deal and other proposals, there is a return to a Christian notion of abstinence. This goes back in time, an impossible move. It is correct in opposing the machinery of consumption, but as an aesthetics, and it is one, it establishes a dance in which only certain kinds of actors can perform or be conceived. It tries to put the state in control of capital by setting up something simpler than capital. It risks becoming a reduction, perhaps a form of authoritarianism. Puritanism provides us an aesthetic with an aesthetic foundation for such a spirit. The subjects of rationality become subjects of rationing. Nevertheless, we need an ethical aesthetics that surpasses the desiring machines of consumption. So what we want to propose is two things. Firstly, we need something more abstract than capital to subordinate capital. To be more abstract means to be more expressively powerful, to be a superset of the regime of abstraction that can reorder it. Economic growth is a clumsy abstraction that determines too many things. Capitalism has come to its limits in its inexorable effects of devastation. The game theory of neoliberal abstraction has failed to become complex enough to adequately express the generativity of the world. We need to exercise the strategic ghosts of the limited capacities of computing of the Cold War from the diagrams of the present. If we need something more abstract than capital to subordinate capital, one way to do this might be to use the greater capacities of abstraction and hyperdimensionality of contemporary computing to create new diagrams of abundance for the present. If such power can be used to reorganize and train psyches and corral economies, as well as with the digital enclosures of the networks, it can certainly take us beyond the small set of variables in neoliberalism. It might be said that this is already a terrain that is avidly colonized and reshaped and hence harder to reorder, but in the technical nature of these real abstractions is the inherent possibility for redesign. Secondly, along with this, we need an ecological, ethical aesthetic of abundance, not treating the world as a set of externalities that can be consumed, but as thriving parts of the networks and what exceeds them. Equally, an ethical aesthetic that is beyond austerity as a response to crisis, an aesthetic of carnival rather than that of puritanism, one that would re recognize the capacity for abundance, imagining differently, imagine differently than accumulation and overconsumption. Thank you.
Okay. Um, thank you uh, for the main lectures. And we're very honored to have two excellent uh, respondents this evening to the lectures. The respondents will provide some uh, oblique angles to some of the issues raised during the lectures. And then we'll use that as a leaping off point to have a conversation amongst the panel that will seamlessly bleed out into the crowd in the form of Q&A, which is about as unseamless as it comes. Our first respondent is Luisa Prado. And if you've been to the exhibition, you've seen some of her work. She's an artist and a theorist whose work, the one I just mentioned, for those who stand at shorelines, alongside her piece that's in the entangled network book that uh, Christopher mentioned, speaks to borderings and acts of being stranded, of historical abuse manifest in present institutional practices and forms of knowledge production, and more importantly, to the urgent need to decolonize institutional knowledge production and open it to the polyphony too long unheard. Lisa. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think I would like to start my, my moment here as a respondent by maybe referring to the publication and uh, starting with a story, because I believe storytelling is such a powerful way of engaging, perhaps in a way that is a bit oblique, but um, such a powerful tool to talk about, especially devastation and disaster. Um, as uh, the Wilhelm Schusse resident uh, last year, I went to Brazil, where I'm from, um, on August. And uh, while I was there, on August 23rd, 2019, uh, an accident took place in the Rodovia Presidente Dutra, one of Rio de Janeiro's most important federal highways. I'm from Rio, by the way. Um, in a section that cuts through the suburban municipality of Nova Iguaçu, a cargo truck carrying pesticide was hit by another vehicle. Vats rolled out of the truck and spilled their contents all over the at the highway. It was a bright pinkish red liquid was, which was dragged along the whole highway by other vehicles that were passing by, by the wheels of other cars for hundreds and hundreds of meters. The highway was temporarily closed as the liquid, which was considered harmful to humans, was cleaned up. RJTV, uh, which is the region's most popular news, uh, news midday news program, uh, aired footage of workers in hazmat suits shoveling the dried remains of this liquid into large white bags under the strangely cheerful headline of Colorful Dutra. The nature of this pesticide, as well as the name of the company that manufactured it, or companies responsible for manufacturing and transportation, uh, were unmentioned. The ensuing traffic jams slowed the flow of vehicles in the city for hundreds of kilometers. Four days before that, around 3 p.m. on August 19, 2019, Day suddenly turned into night in Sao Paulo, the largest city in South America. The skies above the metropolis, so often obscured by rainy clouds, as anyone who has been there knows, acquired a very strange, very unusual black-brown hue. A sooty curtain falling prematurely over the city's bewildered inhabitants. Later that afternoon, the thick clouds finally released their cargo. A deep black rain, followed by the unexpected scent of smoke. The reason for this dark rain did not take much guessing, actually. 
The fires devouring the Amazon rainforest along Brazil's northernmost states had been in the news for a while. This was just one repercussion, actually, finally reaching the country's largest city, pushed by a cold wind. Sao Paulo's Siete River, which was once a clean, living body of water, had long ago been reduced to a sludgy, foul-smelling mass. And now it was the turn of the skies to fall. Now, I tell you this story because maybe these two scenes you had never heard about. You probably, what you probably heard about were the, for, the fires that were devouring the Amazon rainforest during uh, the European summer, Brazilian winter of last year. I'm telling you these stories because as I was seeing the, pre the previous presentations and uh, thinking about this notion of devastation, one thing that uh, jumped out to me immediately was that this notion of apocalypse or this notion of catastrophe that uh, we are discussing so often now with the climate crisis, the climate emergency, there is, of course, this perception of doom, this feeling of doom that comes with such a discussion. There is a feeling of doom that comes with seeing a whole city engulfed by black rain or a whole highway being washed in, almost, in something that almost looks like blood. But if you think about it, disaster, world endings, apocalypses have happened so many times before. As Olga mentioned, um, the, with Columbus, with European ships that arrived in the Americas, the moment that Europeans put foot in the Americas, that was a world ending. That was a moment when the world ended. Endings have happened many times before. This is not the first. And this is something that uh, thinkers from the land which is currently known as Brazil, hopefully that will change. I like to, to construct the phrase in that way. Um, the land currently known as Brazil, uh, like Ayuton Krenaki or Davi Kopenawa, they remark that when the sky is falling, in uh, Brazilian indigenous cosmologies, there is this uh, notion that the role of the shaman, the role of uh, a spiritual leader, it is, that role is to hold up the sky because the world will end. In indigenous cosmologies, there is a constant fight for that. There is a constant struggle to maintain life, to maintain the conditions for life to thrive. And the role that shamans have to play, and that is a role, of course, that is uh, underpinned to, to all, is the role of holding up the sky. In his book released last year, um, Ayuton Krenaki says, it's a book called Ideas to Postpone the End of the World, which I highly recommend. It has not yet been translated to English, and I hope um, it will translate it very soon. But um, Ayuton Krenaki uh, suggests that our role, when we see that the sky is falling, is to look up and put our arms up and hold it together. And I think, do we still have more time? Or how are we with time? Yeah, I think. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Our second respondent is Nelly Ya Pinkra. She's a theorist and a practitioner currently working on an edited volume with Eric Hurl and Lotte Weinsalt called Critique and the Digital to be published by Diaphanes and University of Chicago Press in the spring. She's also doing a book with Manuela Boyaditsev and Lisa Nakamura in the Maison uh, Minnesota series In Search of Media on Race Scheduled for the autumn. Uh, Nellie has promised to finish her 
uh, contribution with a question which will launch us into the discussion. Yes, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ryan, so much for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for inviting me. And really thank all of you for the contributions. This has been incredibly rich, and I hope I can also contribute something of value. Um, <clears throat> so I was asked to do a five minutes response. Um, that's short, so I'll use it to embed and contextualize the question I will end with. That's what I'm doing, more or less. And um, I'll do that by putting out kind of like three lines of thoughts and then end the question. And I think I was asked to do this response because my own research is um, concerned with the work of the Martinican philosopher and poet, Edouard Glissant and cybernetics. And uh, Edouard Glissant is kind of my point of departure for what I'm doing now. Okay, here we go. So <clears throat> my question will concern two of the main aspects of both of the talks, I guess. And that is, first of all, the notion and concept of the Anthropocene, and then um, relations. And I'll um, expand on that. So, Edouard Glissant brought forward a very distinct poetics uh, throughout his work that was centered around what he called relation, the poetics of relation, or poétique de la relation. Um, there might be other terms to describe it or even subsume under it. This poetics and the poetic knowledge he produced was a means to create new imaginaries. So to think and be differently in an oppressive world, to step outside of a system, of this system, and be differently in an, uh, sorry, and be in reach for those already outside of the system. His work is permeated by the destabilizing of a lot of the you know, Western Enlightenment binaries uh, that organize our thinking, actually, and uh, so our everyday life. One of them being the you know, culture and nature binary. Um, I would love to speak more to that, but I think there's not enough time, <clears throat> maybe later. But with Glissant, every, every culture becomes through nature, and another of these binaries would be the individual and collective binary. And actually, today, the first talk of the day was given by Michelle M. Wright, um, and she said something that really resonated with me, which was, um, she said, she talked about how to consider time uh, and always ask the when and where something happens, which means, for example, she said, we are still individuals, but we are affected by the collective in any given moment in the present. So I really like this kind of distinction because um, it kind of enriches the notion of the individual as well as the collectives, I found. So it also resonates a lot with Lisson's work. And Lisson's relation is not a passive one, it is not absolute. It is about the realization of a totality of re relation in movement. So I'm quoting, um, he said, it, w it is about developing a sensitivity to relations in a way that renders one unable to participate in non-relational imaginaries. So even that which we ignore or don't know about the world and our moral and political knowledge and decision-making continues to affect us and others beyond our present. So a world in which one is, quite simply, and one agrees to be with and among others. So I think this is what Fred Moulton calls the consent not to be a single being, which is a sentence he took from Edouard Glissant. So that was the first one. The second one. In a billion black Anthropocenes or none, <clears throat> a book by Kath Catherine Yusuf, she interjects into the narrative of white geology, as she calls it, and I'm quoting her, and um, also this speaks to what Olga already said. I'm quoting Catherine Yusuf. The Anthropocene might seem to offer a dystopic future that laments the end of the world, but imperialism and ongoing settler colonialism have been ending worlds for as long as they have been in existence. The Anthropocene as a politically infused geology and scientific popular discourse is just now noticing the extin extinction it has chosen to continually overlook in the making of its modernity and freedom. So this intervention, it just cuts right into it. It is about relations of power, oppression, and an ongoing, and I'm borrowing a term from Diana McCarthy um, from this morning, an ongoing active ignorance actually towards specific geographies, groups of people that still seem to be not human enough 
to be considered in certain processes and realities. This is still a reality. And I'm already at the third point. Um, I will quote again. So just this month, um, a scholar from, I think, Amory University put out a book, as it seems, an incredible book. I've not yet read it all, but I, I tried. Um, she's called Valérie Loichot. Um, a book on the representations of lives lost to water in contemporary poetry, fiction, theory, mixed media art, video production, and underwater sculptures. And in it, she works through some of the late Glissantian work in reference to the Anthropocene, which is incredibly interesting, and um, I will quote something from this book. Shortly, like in, I think, his last public conference, Glissant was asked, asked a question, which was, is there a politics of the living? And I will read his answer. If it's a matter of a politics of the living of, the, of planet Earth, I fully agree. But if it's a matter of a politics of the living of humans, I fiercely object, because the living of the being develops, as I have said, on its own. And if we subject it to the scalpel in an attempt to create clones, we introduce in its chain of unpredictability the predictability of death, for the living is unpredictable. As far as the living of the planet goes, I agree with the measures to be taken, with one restriction. Are we sure to know the intimate laws, rules, and mechanisms of the functioning of the living of the planet? Absolutely not, which raises a serious concern, obviously, we have to preserve forests, obviously, we have to act, but are we sure that the planet does not heal by itself ever so slowly, even if, in the meantime, it crushes us? Are we sure that our fate, the fate of humans, is tied to that of the planet? Okay, and so... I'm ending this, these lines of thoughts um, by quoting another person, which is the political author, Binia Jamchak a Berlin-based political author, who said the utopia of the present is not anchored in any place or another. We will find it in a movement or a relationship. And this also you know, nicely speaks to what you ended with, with which was uh, hold up the sky together. And I think what, I'm, what I will ask all of you now um, is the question of how what kinds of relations, and I mean that in the word, or I mean that in a sense how Edouard Glissant put it forward, but I think you all know what I mean by that, but what kinds of relations are being put forward by the aesthetics or the politics or the projects you um, invited us to know about? What are the kinds of relations we build, not only with one another, but with the economy, with the ecosystem, with anything that is actually out there, with ourselves, to find a way in this world next to devastation. And if, I mean, we, it was mentioned, so platform, platforms was, were mentioned, and then you spoke about a mutual contact. And I'm really trying to, I, I think for the politics, we have to imagine to be able to sustain this world, whatever that means, the question of how we relate will be a crucial question. And so this is my question to your talks, which is a very wide one, and I, I hope we can dive into discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. Well, true to her word, um, Nelly gave you something to grab a hold of. Um, I'm sure you can answer it succinctly in two minutes. Um, no, just joking. So, please, um, Bernard, uh, Olga, Matt, as you wish. I mean, I guess I'm at the end of the queue, so. <laughs> um, I, th I think this, these are really good questions uh, to start with. I don't think that they need answers in a sense. There's always this kind of quest, this question needs to be repeated over and over again, is what are, what are the aesthetic consequences that is, what are, the, what are the implications for ways of, of sensing and of sense-making that uh, are proposed by 
any form of, of economic, in, industrial, or ecological structure. And I think with, with, with Gleeson, in a sense, um, one doesn't have to know the answer uh, in a way. You know, it's in, in, in a way, the answer is uh, a kind of a grotesque mimicry of, of what, is what is necessary. But for, you know, formulations towards an answer would be, um, I, I think there is, at the moment there's a, there's a kind of lack of, and this is why we wrote about devastation, there's a lack of um, the ability to name the way in which the world is, is being trashed, you know, in, in the sense that even the, the word climate change is, 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 is a, a quite a trivial formulation we, we propose in this book um, climate damage as a, as a very specific intentional thing that it's it's known that it's 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 been known about for several decades and it's, it's time that it was named properly um, but we also think that we have you know an inadequate philosophical and, and aesthetic vocabulary to talk about the kind of destruction that uh, the West uh, specifically has, has developed over the last few hundred years uh, so we need to start to really to talk about that quite precisely um, with, with, with new language. And we also need to say that the, the way in which um, the kinds of economies we live in are also the same, have the same mental structures, the same aesthetic structures as the economies of deterrence uh, that the states uh, that we live in operate by. And so there's, there's, an, there's a formal equivalence that is designed specifically in um, in neoliberal economy and in uh, the Cold War, the deterrence of the Cold War, that actually deters the possibility to think properly uh, about the, the situation we're in. And I think we need to, uh, first of all, start redesigning the way we think by the kinds of experiments and kinds of experience that Art proposes, that Bernard is proposing in, in economies and forms of education, uh, but also in forms of uh, direct action directly against uh, forms of um, of environmental damage uh, that we're that we're seeing, and you know, direct action as a form of gaining knowledge. Not an easy question to answer, um, uh, and um, just building up a little bit on, on what Matt said, I guess in the book, we uh, try to talk about bad things in a way that's beyond um, a resolution into um, a solution. Um, and in, in this way, trying to get out of certain um, situation in which it seems like nothing can be really achieved. And um, so a lot of the things that we discuss are kind of neither here or nor there, and they move in, be in between extremes but maybe never quite go to the extreme yet and so they become this kind of insurmountable things and with the resolvability it is a question of a sense that nothing can be done which you would hear a lot but obviously it's not just like um, a habit of thought it is also a structure that's generated and once it's generated it can also be destroyed right if you uh, uh, understand how it works and along other lines, we were thinking about how the chance for species or humans to survive, uh, referring back to what um, you both talked about, is structured alongside also neoliberal um, mathematical and uh, economic models of risk, uh, and then um, quite archaic um, mythological forces being recruited such as fate and luck, so the people, or non 